Paul? A little. You have one minute. I have one minute? Okay. Yeah. In which case? Everybody right. who's going to be here is here. <coughs> <laughs> oh. The open records law says to be stuck out start until you. We're not. I'm waiting. <laughs> we can well, it should the say that we have to start the other meeting on time then. And that's why I believe when it's scheduled for 7, we're supposed to be in there at oh. 7. Well, that's true, too. That's hard. Okay, so talk fast tonight. <laughs> Actually, are we ready? Okay. Um. Good evening. Welcome to uh, the City Council study session. It's Monday, December 3rd at 6 p.m. Uh, our first agenda item this evening is aid to agencies in-kind donation discussion. And Interim City Manager Dorothy Hargrove is here to review aid to other agencies in-kind donations. Thank you, Mayor Pro Tem. Would you prefer I sit down there for cameras or I'm okay here? You may sit here. Thank you. Thank you. Um, in the August 6th um, City Council discussion, um, you decided to discontinue a, to direct financial contributions to aid uh, for uh, nonprofit agencies in the city, uh, but requested staff to post and encourage people to apply for in-kind donations. Um, we posted those uh, requests for donations on the website, on uh, social media, uh, tried to get the word out to deserving organizations, and we received um, three responses, which are in your packet. The first from the Englewood High School Veterans Memorial Annual Memorial Day event, uh, the second from the Englewood Historic Preservation Society, and the third from Special Olympics. Um, at uh, my request, actually, I um, asked if we uh, could work with um, our uh, staff to put just rough dollar amounts on what some of these might, might incur. I mean, hanging up the banner, for instance, for the Met Veterans Memorial doesn't cost us anything but half an hour of someone's time. Some of the requests were, you know, we'd appreciate any assistance with printing. So uh, you will see the, the costs associated here. We said, like, printing would be $35 an hour for graphic design plus the cost of the printing. So it was a little open-ended. Um, I don't want you to think that the um, information we provided on pricing is in any regard firm, um, but it just gives you some indication of the value of uh, the in-kind donation that, that we're <coughs> offering. Um, given that, um, I would um, open it up to your questions and leave it to the mayor to describe uh, or to um, decide on a decision-making platform for these. Okay, thank, thank you. you. Any questions? Councilmember Martinez. Um, in the past, have we received in-kind donations from additional organizations? It seems like three for in-kind um, is, is quite low. Actually, um, it, it is. I'm not sure that we've always been this formal about it. Mm -hmm. Frankly, I think some council members would have a better history of that than I. Um, so we have donated, you know, and, and worked cooperatively. But I think in this particular um, uh, process, we... I don't know that we've ever done it quite this way before. So I think that may have, have limited uh, some of the groups that we've given information to. Thank you. Councilmember Berentine. Um, I think that's what that brought to us, Councilmember <coughs> Martinez, was um, that there was some in-kind always done for some of them before. I just don't think that we, I think that uh, the interim um, the acting city manager is correct. It just it wasn't listed that way. So we didn't, when we got rid of it, was my understanding that we didn't want to X out things that were at no cost. I believe that right. Council Member Cuesta brought that up, that if things were not of a cost to us or something like using a building or being in the newspaper, not a newspaper, newsletter, it's whatever, or, or magazine, that things that we could do that were not, you know, that would be 
just consideration things. So that was nice that some people brought it forward. I like the way that you at least put it out there. I think part of the concern was is that we were all surprised that it got put out there for people to apply and then we had that discussion. So I think this is accurate for what we discussed. So. Okay, thank you. Any other questions? Um, I do have one and that, so like if the Inglewood Historic Preservation uh, Society has some things that we could help them with like printing or the graphic design, if, if our staff is busy doing something else that's more important, then that gets put on the back burner or is it generally there is somebody available? It helps immensely uh, speaking as, you know, uh, working with the communication department if we know in advance. I mean, the Historic Preservation Society, um, you know, has their monthly activity, so it would be easy to schedule something like that. A last minute request is sometimes harder to fill. Okay. All right. Um, thank you. Council Member Wink. Thanks, Mayor Pro Tem. My comment is similar to what you said, Mayor Pro Tem. My only concern would be that um, one of these three organizations might need above and beyond what we've estimated best of our knowledge right now and at the time we staff might not be able to support them so I I just want to make sure that we we, we do in the end we can support the three organizations um, I and mean, I don't know what contingency looks like at this point but I think this is wonderful and I think the organizations are worthy for sure so I I love the way this was put together thank you Yes, thank you. <clears throat> um, Council Member Cuesta. Thank you, Mayor Pro Tem. What is the question before us tonight? What are we deciding out of this? Uh, are we going to have consensus to move forward with in-kind donations? That would be my understanding. I'm not sure that it requires a resolution because there's really no direct financial um, obligation um, on the part of the city. So I think it would be sufficient for Council to, to agree to have us um, help these organizations in the way that they've asked. Uh, it, it is, I think everybody has mentioned thus far, some of these are a bit more varied um, in all tremendously worthy causes. Uh, but for instance, the Special Olympics is a, a bit more defined, whereas with the, um, with the printing, that, that's a bit more of a window. If we approve to move this forward, do we put a cap on any of these? Or I guess, at what point would we say right. that we would have a threshold that, that we'd be comfortable donating up to, but probably not beyond that point? And is that something we would be setting this evening or would that take place uh, later? Good question. Um, I, I frankly hadn't thought of it in those terms. I would be willing to suggest um, that for this year, because of the nature of the requests, um, that we could report to council if we find that there are, are issues or they're asking more than we're reasonably able to provide. And all of these organizations, I'm sure, you know, we could we could have that discussion. So I, I didn't want it to become, you know, focused just on the money, just a recognition that there was some cost. But um, I'm I, I don't think we could say what a reasonable cap would would be um, at this point. Uh, We'd be comfortable with that approach. Uh, thank you. Thank you, um, Council Member Martinez. Thank you. I'm comfortable moving forward with as it is outlined now. I think what you suggested, it makes a lot of sense. Um, and I just want to remind the community that the only discussions we've had prior to this is saying that the regular financial uh, contributions would only be on hold for 2019. So we'll, we'll discuss again the big picture next year. Yes. Okay, thank you. Council Member Wink. Thank you, Mayor Potem. So I do believe that on August 6th, when the decision was made to discontinue eight to the eight for 2019, best decision we could make based on what we knew at that time and I think with the in-kind donations I think I agree with with what we proposed I, I'm comfortable moving forward I think our donations would be well appropriated to these three organizations uh, from whom we've received applications all three perform an integral service for our community by honoring veterans and preservation of our city's history and individuals with intellectual disabilities so I'm definitely in favor of this Okay, thank you. Councilmember Cuesta, did you have something else? Oh, no, pardon me. Okay. Councilmember Barentine. Um, <coughs> the 
I believe that we were going to move some of this money to some of the other funding that was going on was what the discussion was. Was that what you were Can going you speak to? Just yeah, speak, speak into the microphone, oh. please. There was a purpose for moving the money and why it was only the one year, although um, if we could just go over that piece again, which I think um, you might, were you going to do that? I don't know where that, that money was reallocated to. Okay. I, I could certainly investigate but, but We I need to just reinvestigate that. And then the other thing is that we always had, uh, we've always voted on this, on the eight other agencies, so we do need to vote on it any time we're appropriating okay. money. So it will come to us for a vote, and at the time it comes to us for a vote, I'm sure we'll have some, um, some uh, <coughs> funding allocated with that. I mean, when you do something like, we're going to put you in the, in the uh, magazine, I mean, you could do the MasterCard commercial on that and say it's priceless. I mean, that's, that's a lot of money. I mean, there's been people who have been featured in there and businesses that have been featured in there, and I'm sure everybody would like to um, who has anything, and that's, that's valuable. But then again, it's a service, and we have to put something in there. So, I mean, um, I, I want to have that be reasonable because we... I mean, if somebody were to go ahead and work up a magazine on their own and do all that, and so how we do the pricing on that is kind of important. I mean, and I would agree. At this time, we do not sell advertising in the Citizen. Right, but we do we do feature sure. people and how they get picked and how the businesses get I picked agree. is. I'm, I'm I'm sure a, a, a process will find out about it some at, at some time. But um, so how we work that out because I think part of the reason we were doing this was because there's some organizations that if we could do in kind with, because we believe that they're valuable enough and if all we have to do is let them have access to the building or do some of these things, so we want to be cautious. But I do appreciate Council Member Cuesta's mm -hmm. point that we want to make sure that there's some reasonableness there to, on, or acknowledgement on what we're spending, so I appreciate that. Thank you. If I may, um, we, this does need to come for a, a vote of council. Okay. Okay. We will prepare an appropriate motion. Okay. And I'm I'm okay with moving this forward also. Um, and I mean, at this point, there's only three, um, so it might be a good way for us to evaluate what happens in the future. I do have one question. Um, the this uh, woman that came forward to speak to us at a city council meeting maybe a month ago to talk about renting space would this be something aid to other agencies or that would be different a I, yeah she, she's a for-profit for business okay so. these are all non profit exactly okay all right thank you all right so with that um, we will move that forward um, the second agenda item this evening is request for a proposal for an in Inglewood Environmental Foundation Audit. Acting Finance and Administrative Services Director Maria Sabata is here to discuss the EEF or Inglewood Environmental Foundation Audit Statement of Work. Good evening. Hello. How is everybody? Just fine. How are you? Good. Good to see all of you. Um, yes. So we have had several conversations over the past several months regarding uh, an audit for the uh, Englewood Environmental Foundation. And I wanted to give council an opportunity to review the uh, proposed statement of work that would be included uh, in a request for quotes on the audit. Um, so included in your packet is a summary of the items that we have asked um, the, any audit firm, well, we haven't yet, but we will, um, ask audit firms to uh, provide us with their proposal to um, review the work that's included. Um, I will say the timeline's also included, and you know, based on anything that you might think is missing from the current statement of work, we would issue the request for proposal on December 11th with expected responses back um, at the end of January because we need to allow a time for questions and answers to be provided on BIDNET as an addendum. 
Um, but any changes that you would recommend now we could include. Um, and then we would expect that the audit would be completed within three to six months um, after issuance of that RFP return. I will say we will come back to council with a request to actually move forward with um, whoever we select or would recommend as the, uh, the, the audit firm that would actually conduct the work. So I'm here today um, to ask you uh, to let me know if you believe that anything is missing. At this point, um, we have asked for audit firms to provide us with a quote to review EFE's cash disbursements, cash receipts, uh, journal entries, and finances uh, for EFE from its inception um, through 2018. We expect that the cost would be around $55,000, but we can't be prescriptive. Obviously, that will not be included in the RFP. Um, and I also um, want to leave it somewhat open-ended, too, and not as prescriptive, because I'd like to understand from the audit firms some of the things that they would like to look at as well. So, so with that, I'll answer any questions that you might have regarding the statement of work that's included. Okay. Do we have any questions? Council Member Berentine. Is, who's <coughs> deciding on which firms were this? So I think we will come back with a recommendation. Who's the we? I'm sorry. Um, the, um, the board of EEF and then also um, in conjunction with Dorothy, I believe. You know, I think we'll make a recommendation to Dorothy based on what we have and give her an opportunity to review them as well. Um, would you like to see the proposals, all of the proposals? I'm, I'm not sure that it might not be a good idea for the, for the council to, you know, have some sway on, on, on who's hired. I, I would like to try and um, have some distance, some objectivity, or at least have it, have it appear as objective as possible so that Eve isn't just in control of this because then that doesn't look, may not look as good if, unless this council would like to go ahead and do. I have some other questions on the um, outline of, of what you have here for the RFP, but um, I just wanted to ask first about the, um, who was gonna be making the decision. I, I don't want to do anything that puts the board in any more of a precarious position than it already is. I want to try and make sure that we do this, do it once, and satisfy everybody's concerns um, in a way that's ob as objective and honest and transparent as possible. So that's just one of the first steps of that is how we pick this. I appreciate that. Would you recommend, and with that, would you recommend that you know, if we receive five return proposals that the board um, actually presents you with three options or would you like to see all five? I'm not saying we're going to get five, but do you want to see all of them or a subset? Council Member Wink. Thank you, Mayor Pro Tem. I agree with what Member Barentine just suggested and in light of that, I think it would be good for council. I think we'll achieve pure objectivity if we're looking at the totality of what you receive. Um, I think that achieves that goal. Okay. Thank you. Other questions or comments? I have another question. Okay. Can I ask a question? Yes, you may. Okay. Um, so do you want the information to come back via a study session or do you want to actually select um, who, we, who we go with in through a, mo a motion at a meeting? comes back to a regular meeting or study session. I mean, Council Member uh, Berntine. I mean, I would suggest that we probably would um, have an opportunity, whoever the finalists are that you guys pick, then if we have some finalists that we would actually interview them would probably be the better way to go. Okay, so can I just, can I respond to that? Sure. Yes. Okay. <laughs> um, so, uh, we just were asked to bring forth all of them, um, so we would bring that to a study session. And oh, if I'm sorry, if I right? misunderstood that. That's I okay. Apologize. No, that's okay. And then we would actually select one individuals that we might interview. Can we do that in a study session? Yes. Okay. Mm -hmm. So we would do that in a study session. That would probably be early February, okay. from a timing perspective. Um, we would schedule that. So it might put the date that we actually complete the audit back from May, depending on 
what the proposals state. But okay, um, so a study session with all of the proposals, and uh, from that we'll narrow down the list. And right? Okay. For interview so, candidates? Mm -hmm. for candidates? Lots of, so far, Council Member Cuesta. Thank you, Mayor Pro Tem. Uh, we're getting into some new ground, at least. Um, since the time I've been here. I've, I'm at a year now, and we've never had all the bids come in for our review um, on any particular contract. And at the end, it said this contract will be awarded to the lowest reliable, responsive, and uh, reliable, responsive, and responsible bidder. What if we decide it's the, it's the highest price bidder is the one we want to go with? Are, are there rules within um, how we can select these things? If we get five and one's 50,000, one's 100K, and we like the 100K one, is it reasonable for us to say we just like that guy more? I, I think perhaps there's other, this is my opinion as one of all of you, is there are other criteria that we need to base this on besides just the lowest bidder because we definitely want an independent person that has no connections with the city. So I... Um, I think it's a little bit different this time instead of it may be the lowest bidder, but it may not be reasonable to do that either, in my opinion. And I think that's fair too, it, which leads me to um, we probably would need a criteria then. If we're going to be doing this essentially like it, uh, it, we're interviewing candidates that we would probably need to get together and what are the questions? Well, I'm not sure if we need uniform questions, but at least we need everything, some sort of template of what we're looking for um, mm -hmm. out of each one. Um, so probably some prior preparation on that and we should um, all weigh in on it. Thank you. Okay, thank you. Councilmember Martinez. I was also going to suggest um, if we're going to be so involved that we should probably align on the criteria at which we're going to use to select um, a firm to do this. So maybe concurrent while the RFP is being worked on, maybe council <coughs> will spend some time thinking about the criteria as well. Okay. Um, and it's a study session or something. All right, thank you. Uh, I would just like to um, respond to Mr. Cuesta's question. Um, you, if you decide not to go with the lowest bidder, um, you could pass that by resolution. That's, that's true with Thank anything you. we do, to, to remind you of that. Um, and I also had a question, if I may uh, piggyback on uh, Ms. Savada. Would you, as a council, want to interview the firms or just review the proposals that are given? Do you want an in-person or a Skype interview? Just thinking logistically. Thank you. Thank you. Um, council Member Barentine. Well, to answer your question, I think it's important that we interview them. I don't think it's a, a difficulty with um, doing it Skype if there's somebody else that's coming in. Um, I do have some questions on the, I agree with Council Member Martinez, the Council would have to agree on what criteria we're trying to set. The, um, it's brought up, brought up over and over again. I mean about the audit that they're already part of with um, the CAFR. The CAFR, um, I've been inundated with people reminding me that the CAFR is not an audit that is designed to catch any fraud or um, misuse. It is a policy and procedures CAFR. Like Alamosa found out, and when things happen, the CAFR didn't protect those communities from that. That's not what the CAFR is for. So. Um, the um, comment that it, they would be reviewing, I think that the city attorney made, not, which I, I, I disagreed with, but I think I knew where she was going with it, uh, is not that EFE has been audited before. It has been part of the CAFR, but it has not been audited before. So there are not previous audits of this nature to go back and look at it for. So the council would have to come up with some ideas on how they would like to go ahead and move forward. This is very much on the policies and procedures and focused, and I think that that is not going to reassure the public uh, for the issues that they have brought up. So I would like to um, make sure that we have a better outline of exactly what we're trying to accomplish so that we answer people's questions. And we may need to have a study session or do something to do that. I would agree with Member Martinez that that should have to happen. Okay, thank you. I'm just lighting this because I want to say something. Um, the I know that um, some of the council members wanted to do the parts of the performance audit also, but I'm really wondering if it would be wise um, to do 
more of the forensic piece of this audit and then when we ruled out other things I, I think everybody knows that the performance piece we aren't following the rules of procedure um, that that would be something that we could cover um, I don't know I'm, I'm throwing that out there as a question uh, for the other council members also because I I think we may end up getting the cost a lot higher if we try to focus on both of them. Councilmember Martinez. I think that is a good question, and considering that we have talked about um, how to restructure it going forward or how to handle it going forward, I think the performance piece um, and processes and procedures is going to be um, equally as important. So I think I would like to leave that in. Leave that in to begin, even at the beginning. Yes. Okay. Thank you, uh, Councilmember Wink. Thanks, Mayor Pro Tem. Um, were you, well, to what you just said, it, um, are you, are you of the belief that the, f um, the fiscal, sorry, not the fiscal, the forensic audit would reveal, would likely reveal some of what we may have wanted to look at in the performance piece and that perhaps if we focus and on that a little ahead right. of the performance and it, we might get the results we want anyway because if if that's what you feel I'm I mean because performance is tied to to in some part is tied to what we're gonna find out from from the uh, forensic audit and um, it's good to know that the cost of this audit does not come from our funds correct but it right. comes from EFE's funding right um, so that's something to consider, certainly. Um, I'm okay either way. Uh. Um, <clears throat> thank you for that. And I, what I'm wondering is if a forensic audit would show even maybe the areas that we have to delve in deeper as far as the performance. Can you answer that question? Okay. So I did some research uh, with our auditors that actually <clears throat> audit the CAFR to help me describe the difference between a forensic audit and a performance audit. A forensic audit is typically conducted when fraud has been absolutely determined and to primarily to determine the amount of fraud that's been incurred for use in a court case. I don't know that we have necessarily uh, determined whether or not there has been any fraud. I think part of this audit is to answer that question, quite frankly. And I do believe that looking at a performance audit and evaluating the transactions that I've listed um, would give them an opportunity, would give an auditor an opportunity to answer or to ask questions where that could be determined. Um, so <clears throat> if the sample that they select, for example, uncovers something that might seem questionable, at that point you, we could probably ask for an additional audit on top of the original audit to do 100% of, you know, the cash disbursements, um, you know, in the event that you find that. Um, so there's a couple ways that we can probably get to the answers that we're looking for. I would just suggest that that's really the difference. And I apologize I wasn't here the night that we talked about the differences between the two audits, um, but that was something that was information that um, I wanted to share with you. Okay. Thank you. Um, Council Member Berentine. There are, ex are, are very specific questions coming up and concerns coming up. Um, ownership of businesses and the, the, they're pretty specific and they go to more of a forensic audit um, style than what a performance audit is going to do. We already know what those questions are. Um, they are questions that were already brought up and are pretty public in the district attorney's report um, and have been more researched over the last six months uh, by the public. And they are very specific questions, and those are the questions we need to answer. And that, that's going to be done by a forensic audit. It's not going to be accomplished by a performance audit, and you know that. So we're, we're going to have to address that first, and I don't want it to look like we're playing around with this or, or wasting time or trying to... I mean, I, mean, I just want the very clear-cut questions that we have and that have been raised already just to be put on the table, asked objectively and transparently, evaluated 
by an objective professional, and then let's get the real answers out here so that we can deal with the situation. And I don't think that's going to satisfy the public that this has been brought to, who have brought a lot more into this than I could have ever imagined in what they've taken a look at and research. So we need to be willing to just go ahead and figure out what we're doing here, and that's not going to be done by the performance. So I don't uh, disagree that if this council is going to consider uh, being the board, um, that it, we certainly might want to go ahead and look at some of the performance piece of it and how that would even be possible, what we would need to do or what would look right uh, for that. Uh, but we're not going to know what we're dealing with unless we answer the questions that the public are coming up. Otherwise, we're just going to keep having it happen and we'll just waste money. I appreciate that. My opinion. Thank you. Can I ask a question? Yes, and always. That, okay, great. Um, so on page one of the request for proposal under scope of work, I tried mm -hmm. to capture the information that was shared by the public in uh, public hearing section uh, sessions during previous meetings, um, particularly um, the first three bullets. In conjunction with key city staff, perform a risk assessment of financial policies and procedures to determine specific areas for audit work to be performed. From this prioritization, develop an audit schedule encompassing those areas. Perform audit of key areas according to the prioritized schedule developed above. Analyze the data obtained for evidence of deficiencies in controls, fraud, or lack of compliance with management policies procedures as established in Articles of Incorporation for ETH. Ensure Tabor law has not been violated. I can unequivocally say that each three of these statements came directly from public hearing comments that I wrote down, and I felt that I was addressing that. So that will get to the forensic piece, in my opinion, of the equation. The second page <clears throat> talks a little bit more about the purchasing and accounting payable uh, policies and procedures, again, to support whether or not there was fraud, um, and then internal controls. Um, the, the last four, you know, you could say their best practice is more of a performance audit. So my question back to the council is, which ones should we include, which ones should we exclude, and what should we add to satisfy the requests that the public and you have all made to review EF? Because I can make those adjustments to the statement of work tonight so that we make sure we answer those, if anything was missed. Okay, thank you. Council Member Cuesta. Uh, thank you, Mayor Pro Tem. Uh, after, on the first sub bullet in the scope of work, you've got your primary bullet and then the sub bullet. And the, the first sentence is in conjunction with key city staff, perform a risk assessment of financial policies and procedures to determine specific areas for audit work. Who would those key staff members be? Primarily me. <laughs> um, and this is typical, um, if I could proceed. Uh, and, and again, you know, now that we have new information and you'd like to be a part of that, we certainly, like uh, Member Wink has said, that we would go back through this next couple of weeks and talk about what the prioritization of our criteria to evaluate. We could do that. But typically, it is an auditor that comes in and looks at the key areas of risk that we have just based on doing a sampling. That was the sampling that I was mentioning before. Um, and if they see an area of concern where things weren't buttoned up, like we, uh, you know, I think we are all aware information was brought to the council that we could not locate contracts for some of the work that was done, that would raise a red flag. And so then the audit scope that they would, or um, proposal that they would return to us would indicate, or um, the proposal would state that upon this risk, risk assessment, assessment, they would come back and they would do a broader audit of that particular area because the proposal would already have been done. Uh, to that point, and thank you, this is educational for me as well. Uh, it wouldn't be, we wouldn't be going over every line item for the past 20 years, give or take, going back to 1997. We're, we'd be doing samplings along the way then? At the beginning, they would do samples. If they found issues that were deemed um, potentially involving fraud or other things, they would dig deeper. That's basically how an audit is typically done. Thank you. And I think that's good to know, just so, again, everybody can have the peace of mind that it wasn't 
well, things were cherry picked here and there, and can we have full confidence in this? At the end of the day, I want nothing more than everybody to be on the same page and everybody have the peace of mind that we, that uh, objective, fair, and uh, all in all, competent audit was conducted. Um, now, if that's industry standard, so be it. I'm happy to go down the road of whatever uh, these things are. I, I would hate to leave openings where we keep getting uh, concerns raised or even suspicions raised, uh, which I think has got us here to this point, and, and many with, with justification. But um, I'm hoping we can put some firm numbers and just reassurances to the general public behind this. Thank you. Can I respond to yes, that? Yes, please. So a couple of things. Um, in audits that I've been involved in, um, one of the things that we might consider doing um, is having interviews, separate interviews, or the count, uh, someone could come here and interview, or we could take questions down. Because as a CFO and several other organizations, auditors would typically meet with me and say, are you aware of anything related to, to fraud? And it would be an official statement in an audit that I would have to respond to. Likewise, I, I don't know how it would work for the city, but perhaps that might be something we could consider. And I wanted to clarify something I said. When an auditor comes in, I, I won't have a conversation with them about what to look at, quite frankly, unless if I'm aware of a specific thing that I want them to look at for my peace of mind as, um, as the CFO or director of finance for the city. Um, so I, it's an arm's length. They, they determine what they're going to look at, what samples they're going to select, et cetera. So I just wanted to make sure I made that clear. Council Member Berntine. It is unique in the situation that you are part of that board. Your position is part of that board. Um, our, our city staff is part of that board. Uh, but they are a separate corporation. And we actually don't have the authority to do what we're... We actually don't have the authority to do what we're doing. And it is nice that they are paying for that. But the money that we are using is still the taxpayer's money. The asset that Eve has belongs to the taxpayers. Um, the debt that they put in is the debt of the taxpayers, and we don't release the assets. It all gets a little convoluted, so I understand that this puts you in an awkward position as well, and I'm trying very hard to make sure that, to Council Member Cuesta's point, that we do the best job we can to make sure that there is some separation there so that when this is done, the people that are currently on this board can have some assurance that it's, it's done for them. Whatever may have happened in the past is acknowledged or either recognized and accountable or said we're fine and, and that we can move forward. And so I understand your position in this, um, but um, the more I said to Council Member Costa's point, the more that the city staff is involved or people that are on that board are involved, the, the more precarious and potentially wasteful this whole process would be. And I, don't, I, I just don't want to have that. So I'm, I'm, I, I think it would be a good idea for Council to take a better lead on trying to make sure that we come up with exactly, and it may not be more scope kind of things, but there are going to be very specific questions that people just want answered, and we just have to be as direct as possible to get those areas done. So it may be a little bit of outreach for the community as well, but um, council needs to come up with the guidelines for that. And it seems a little, when you use words like sampling, or if we see something there, we'll go back and check it more, or that you've worked with the CAFR, I mean, I, 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 I can't count on my fingers and toes how many people have watched all the Queen's horses now. The CAFR doesn't mean anything to them. I, I understand that. We've sat here and asked the auditors who do the CAFR, in any way would your audit go ahead and expose any kind of uh, corruption or misdealings or m m the money going? And they are very specific in saying, no, that's not what they're hired for. So since that's become pretty general knowledge now, then that's why we're trying to make sure that we're a little bit more specific with this and just make it work worth the money. And it is still the taxpayer's money, but it, you're, it, is, uh, it is appropriate, I believe, that it comes from Eve. So I'm, try I'm, I'm trying to be aware of the position you're in at the same time, but the more that we use things that seem like it's kind of skirting it down, it, it just brings some red flags up. It just brings some concerns up, that's all. 
and I don't think you're trying to do that. You're trying to do your job. It, it's you're in a position as we all are with this, so we're just trying to get it done. Thank you. Um, <clears throat> and part of the reason I had this question and wanted to separate it a little bit, I had asked my nephew, who is a certified public accountant, and they do mostly um, performance audits. And so when we were talking about forensic audits, he suggested that there are companies that only do forensic audits. It, so um, are there companies out there that do both? I cannot answer that question today. I do not know. Okay. But I can definitely get you that information. Okay. Thank you. Any other questions or comments? Do you have any? Thank you for getting this. Yes. Started. Do you have any other questions you need answered tonight? I do because um, I was planning or we were planning on issuing this statement of work and RFP on December 11th. Um, but I want to ask. Do we want to have you provide questions that you would specifically want answered that aren't currently included? Would you like an answer as to whether or not there's uh, audit firms that strictly do forensic and performance before you make a decision uh, or you give me a head nod, I guess, because it's not a formal decision that I could move forward? So how would you like me to proceed? I guess it's my big question. Comments from council? Council Member Wink. Thank you, Mayor Pro Tem. <clears throat> Director Sabata, you, you stated that uh, the first three bullets of on page one under the scope of work speak directly to comments and re requests made, suggestions and requests made by the public, um, as you noted them during regular council meetings. and. If to the best of your knowledge and ability, those, those bullets, and I see the, the detail within them, and they're, they're quite broad and wide-reaching, the points within those three bullets. Um, in your position, given if, if to the best of your ability, those bullets, in, in addition to the other bullets in that set of, in that list set, cover what and should provide the information that the public wants, then I'm okay with that list as is, I wouldn't have any suggestions or any edits to that list to answer your question directly. Mm -hmm. Thank you. Council Member Berntine. I think, I think an audit that would include expecting an auditor to decide whether we have violated Tabor law is, is might be on their scope a little because I'm not sure whether we would be violating Tabor law for this council to take it over since that still a $6.8 million debt that we would be incurring and it would, wouldn't even be from there. And I have also made the suggestion that um, given staff's involvement with this separate corporation and kind of the conflict of interest it creates for everybody um, that we may need to go ahead and still consider getting legal advice on this as well prior to going ahead and doing the forensic audit as well as what the whether we should include something like Tabor Law into a um, I don't think we're going to get the level of comfort on something like that from an auditor I, I don't think that's what they they do um, I think that the bullet points I think your your attempt to try and bring at least some recognition to some of the comments that have been made, but it still seems to be rather focused as the header to this is policies and procedures related to financial policies and procedures. And then the sub bullet points under that are as it relates to financial policies and procedures. It's not what the public is looking for, in my opinion, that would make them comfortable. So I, I do think we need to have some more work on this. I don't think that that um, I mean, I think there's an attempt there to acknowledge that they have those concerns, but if you're doing it under the header, um, the review of EF entity-wide internal control environmental related to financial policies and procedures isn't necessarily what is going to bring us the level of comfort, I think, so we might want to consider it a little more. And then I am concerned about the Tabor 
what we would be expecting from somebody there. Thank you. Council Member Cuesta. Uh, you bet. Uh, between the language, analyze the data obtained for evidence of deficiencies in controls, fraud, lack of compliance with management policies, procedures, um, as established in the articles for EF, and then the, uh, the five sub bullets in the second heading regarding to um, the bidding process, um, how payments were done, contracts being completed prior to work beginning, etc. I, if this is just the RFP, I'm comfortable with what we have here. If we're going to be um, interviewing each one of these companies and, and going through any more specificities we want out of the audit, I'm happy to keep this moving and just go forward with what we have here. Okay. Now, I also would say that when you get into the bullet points beyond the first two groups, it does get into more of a performance. Um, I would say approach to the audit, and I also noticed that you didn't use the word forensic or performance anywhere out here, and I, I appreciate the, the tightrope. You've got to walk there a little bit, too. Um, but I would say that the first two sets of bullets are the most critical, and then um, we can dig into the following ones if they weren't included in this initial audit. Thank you, Mayor Pertem. Thank you. Um, is fraud a pretty far-reaching word? I mean, does it cover a lot of other things, like misappropriation of funds, or, I mean, can you answer that question for me? When you put fraud out there for them to look at, what other things are going to go through their mind? Uh, I think, as you stated, a misappropriation of funds of any kind. So, um, it, to me, that's not performance-related at all. That's inappropriate payments made for work not performed, um, payments made to a, um, an imaginary vendor that doesn't exist. Um, you know, those are just a, a few of the examples. But I do think it's a very broad term. It's any misappropriation of funds. So, or like um, double invoicing, double billing, that is all well, covered. Okay, so those are, that's a question, really. So, so I would almost say, in the case of those last two statements, there could be a process issue and an unintended consequence of that. I, I, if, if obviously the payments were made in a fraudulent manner, someone was paying someone twice, like there was a, an invoice that was paid that was legitimate with a contract, and then knowingly someone makes a duplicate payment hoping it doesn't get caught, of course, that would most likely be considered fraudulent. However, if it was done in error because of a lack of a process control, that's a totally different matter. So I think they, I think each transaction needs to be evaluated separately for fraud. Okay. Does that answer you. your question? Yes. Um, city Attorney. Fraud is a crime. So when you're asking for an investigation into fraud, you're asking for an investigation into is, has there been any criminal acts? there is an entire statute book filled with the variety of different kinds of criminal acts that may be encompassed within that term. So we use fraud as if it was a, a generic term, but it's actually a legal term defined by law. Okay. Thank you. Any other comments or questions? Councilmember Martinez. I was going to say, um, for the RFP, I'm okay with moving forward as it is now. I wonder, um, I assume as uh, people who submit questions for this, it might um, give us a little more insight as to what's possible, if, if there's companies that can do both, if, if, you know, I think it might inform some of what we may need to um, provide and ask. So I'm just, I wonder what our process would be when we get feedback from, or if we can get feedback on the questions they ask one, and um, how we might revise um, our criteria going forward based on the questions that the RFP response folks have. Thank you. I appreciate that. Um, so you all have weighed in on being okay with moving forward with these, especially with especially the first two major divisions. Councilmember Barentine, would you like to weigh I, in on that? I, I think that um, my concern still lies that the header for both of those sections are uh, mandated by policy and procedure. 
uh, as a subset that if under those policies and procedures that there's any concern of fraud, blah, 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 those are those are strong words and nice that it's acknowledged, but it is not the header statement of focus for what we're doing the RFP for. Both of those are listed with only policy and procedure, and then everything else is subset to it. So I would like it to be a lot stronger than that, but I don't want it to hold it up either. Uh, council member Quest is correct that if we have an opportunity to uh, interview people, um, as council member Martinez brought up as well, if we have, have the opportunity to interview people, we can bring up maybe more specific questions that we would like to make sure that are answered and leave this a little bit more as an overall. Uh, but I think that the header, the focus on this still remains on policy and procedure and that is not going to bring the level of comfort that we're looking for for the public. Okay, thank you. Um, <clears throat> I agree with uh, with Council Member Barentine, but also with um, the three of you too. Um, but I think that I don't want to hold this up either. I want to move forward with it so we can get it in the works. And um, so if that is something that can be addressed when we're interviewing, um, do you understand what, what we're asking for? I do. Okay. So is that enough information for you to move forward? It is. Um, happy to do that. I appreciate all of your input. It's, uh, it's certainly helpful. And we will make sure that I think what I'm hearing is, um, in general, this is good, a little bit more emphasis on the forensic slash investigation for fraud aspect of that. Um, and perhaps there is some rewording that I can do to uh, make sure that we get that. And then as we move forward um, with um, putting the proposal out and getting some of the responses, I can make you aware of the questions that we receive and our responses. Uh, by the 25th, that's when they will be published, so uh, 25th of January, so perhaps the following week. Um, and by that time, I, I would have thought of kind of a revised schedule and thoughts to everything that you've also shared with me and just make sure that we're moving forward the way that you see fit uh, after the 25th. But I'll also incorporate that we would expect that there would be some opportunity for them to actually be interviewed by the council as well. Okay. That's not currently in here, so I'll make All sure right. that that's included. Great, I appreciate that. Any additional um, thoughts or comments? Okay, thank you very much. Thank you. Um, and with that, um, this meeting is adjourned and we will resume next door at 7 p.m.